Well, good afternoon. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm one of the hosts here at EdChat Interactive. So EdChat Interactive was formed just under a year ago by Steve Anderson, Tom Whitby, and myself. And as a result of a, quite a few conversations we were having about how there's so many great things going on in education, but unfortunately, there's no great way of spreading best practices. And we were thinking webinars, but it's not the way people learn. Uh, books are great, but you can't really learn how to ride a bicycle by reading a book. There's a lot you can't learn from reading a book. Uh, you were wondering if there was a way that we could figure out to do something more interactive than webinars online. And about that time, we stumbled on this platform, the Shindig platform, which we thought was really a, a unique way of allowing people to interact during the, during the course of a, something similar to a webinar. And so that's what we're using here is the Shindig platform. And the name of what we're doing is EdChat Interactive. And what we're trying to do is to find people really remarkable things in education and allowing them to share with, with educators in a way that's uh, more engaging and compelling than a typical webinar. So because we're using the Shindig platform and because it's a little bit different from, from Anything that you, you've used before, if you haven't been on one of our sessions, what I'd like to do is to run a quick video, and, and it really will be quick, which will explain the different features of Shindig and how to get the most out of it. So let's run the video. Welcome to Shindig, the video chat event provider. This video will guide you through our basic features. Click on any participant's image to engage in a private video chat. Double-click on another participant to add them to your existing conversation. Click the arrow to exit. You can also send an instant message, either to an individual or to your entire room. Want to interact with the host? Use the buttons on the lower right. Click Raise Hand to signal to the event administrator that you want to be brought on stage. Otherwise, submit a question to the host via text. If the system has not automatically detected your webcam and microphone, roll over your image and click Settings. Click your image to enable your working webcam. Choose a working microphone by selecting the option with volume indicators that flash green in response to your voice. We hope this was helpful. Enjoy the event. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. Let me do the intro slides again. And I just, one thing I want to reiterate is that under your icons are these two buttons, one's raise hand and one's ask question. If you click on raise hand, I'll see that you want to interact with me and I'll either IM you or get you into a chat. And if you click on ask question, you can ask me a question and I can either, if it's a technical problem, I can route it to the people from Shindig who can probably handle it. And if it's a question for Garrett, I can signal him that there's a question and he can address it uh, possibly by bringing one of you to the stage or possibly by it, it just providing the answer. So before just introducing is one thing that I'd like everybody to do to practice with Shindig, and that is you to find somebody else who's here, click on their avatar, and maybe ask each other two questions. Um, why don't we try, where are you from? And then for the second question, why don't you ask them what they want to get out of today's session? Or why don't you provide that answer for them? So I'm going to pull myself down. I'd like everybody here, click on another person's icon and ask them, where are you from? And what do you want to get out of tonight? I'm going to stop my broadcast and I'll come back up in about two and a half minutes.
Okay, well, I hope that you all were able to share and talk to each other. If you weren't or you ran into some problems, uh, just click on the icon, click under, under your icon on the button to ask a question, and I'll, I'll either try to answer your question directly or I'll route it to somebody from Shindig. And just want to mention that tomorrow night we're having another EdChat Interactive. Many of you know Mark Barnes. He's been on twice before, uh, January and I think either February or March. He's, he's produced a new book, Hacking Education, and he's going to be talking about different ways that we can come up with quick solutions to improve our lessons, our classes, and our schools, uh, ways that don't require whole studies or long implementation planning, but ways that we can quickly implement. So that should be very interesting. He's a very personable individual, really good talker, uh, very profound thinker, and I think that you'll enjoy it uh, if, you, if you want to register. And then I want to introduce our current speaker, Garrett Zimmer, uh, PB Jelly Games on YouTube, where he's got a YouTube channel with Minecraft tutorials, and thousands of kids follow, follow him uh, every week uh, looking for the latest hint on how to use Minecraft. And then he's also founded a company called MindGage, which is developing curricula uh, for the classroom on Minecraft in various, uh, various domains. So I'm going to stop this. And let me bring up Garrett. Hello, Mitch. How are you? Okay, Garrett. Thank you. Great, Mitch. great. For the, uh, the great Stop. intro, Mitch. We get started. Oh, actually, buddy. we should oh, get started. Sorry, and ahead. let me just ask, I'll ask one question because I probably didn't, you know, I, I mentioned MindGage and I may have blown it. Uh, what exactly oh. is MindGage? So MindGage is a company that we developed to kind of support teachers because there's a there's a couple of challenges with Minecraft. A, in order to build a real immersive, uh, engaging environment that's really going to draw the kids in, um, it takes a lot of time. It, it can certainly take a lot of building effort, and we wanted to spare the teachers the expense uh, of time in building it. And then we moved a step further, and we've now added assessments. We've added integrated assessments. We're developing a backend that's going to allow teachers to basically plug and play these modules into the classroom geared and directly connected to core curriculum and at the same time be able to see what learning is happening without infringing on Minecraft the game uh, and that's going to be one of the things that I'll discuss uh, throughout there but that's essentially what MindGage is is we build curriculum uh, tied to immersive game-based learning environments and provide the assessment and the rigor that's needed to to help improve test scores and marks and everything like that. So would you regard that as a softball question um, that I threw you? I don't know. I hit it. Did I hit it well? You Whether hit it's a softball hit it well. or a hardball? Okay. Home run. Love okay. it. Home run. Okay. Sometime today, I'm going to try, I'm going to, try to throw a sharp, biting, 93-mile-an-hour slider, and I'll see if you hit that. We'll see what I can do. In the meantime, I'm going to come down. I'll bring up your slides. Okay. And, um, you know, and, and, and let you engage with Perfect. the audience. Hi, everybody. How is everybody today? I hope that everybody is doing well. Let me wave back and forth to you guys. Um, I want to clarify one thing that, uh, that Mitch had said. I don't do Minecraft tutorials. Uh, so on my YouTube channel, I was primarily a YouTuber for gaming. And what I did was I created these uh, amazing stories in Minecraft. And I had an opportunity to really drive engagement through storytelling. So I would create these unique concepts in Minecraft. I would make a helicopter actually fly, which if you played Minecraft, you know it's not possible uh, in most senses of the word. And I was doing this on uh, Xbox. And I would tie this all into a story called My Yummy Yummy World. And I would like to, I enjoyed layering it with, um, with morals and with ideas and attitudes and engage with the students at that level so that they really got a chance to not just watch a YouTuber play Minecraft, but they got a chance to see the amazing things that could be done in Minecraft. And not only that, see how some of these stories really tied into their own lives. Uh, so that, that was basically my claim to fame on YouTube. I've got over 13,000 subscribers on YouTube now. Um, and I've taken a step back from the YouTube channel to focus on MindGage because I believe that, uh, that there's more ways that I can use my skills uh, and our team skills to further Minecraft in education. 
So I'll talk to you guys a little bit about the introduction, why we're here. Um, Minecraft is a unique tool, and I think we're all here from the responses that I read on uh, on when you signed up. Um, Minecraft is something that, you know, everybody's kind of like, I use it. What's the best way to approach it? What's the best way to use it? And we're going to cover that. And I cover that from a paradigm of game-based learning and project-based learning. Now, I'll be honest, I've got my particular bias. Uh, I'm very biased towards game-based learning because I've been a gamer since the age of six. And I believe that when you engage in games, it ties into all of the neurotransmitters that are going on in your mind. And it solidifies information, not just in one portion of your brain, not just the cognitive portion. It also solidifies emotionally. It solidifies in many, many other areas in the brain so that recall of information is a visceral action. It's a, it's a, a unique event where you say the name of something, and if you've played a game on it, you're automatically taken back to that game. And that's the experience that I believe is powerful in Minecraft, and I want to help educators around the world get to that level of experience. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. A couple of key questions that I want everybody to be cognizant of is what? What do I want to use Minecraft for? What do I want out of Minecraft? Um, what is my goal here? What's my intention? Who? Who is your audience? So are you, are you keeping an eye on the children? Is it for engagement? Or is it to make sure that they're increasing their marks? Or is your audience the parent? And those are key questions that have to be asked. Why? Why do you want Minecraft as opposed to some other tool? Why do you think Minecraft is powerful as opposed to something else? And of course, if you're struggling with Minecraft, how do you get better? And how do you develop techniques and strategies to, to really make it impactful in your classroom? So we'll go through some examples as well, some resources. And we here at MindGage, we've created an absolutely fantastic toolkit for you. And this toolkit includes the way that we design our game-based learning modules. So there's a, a lesson plan template that we've been using, that we've developed. And it really helps you sort of focus and solidify on the engagement side of Minecraft uh, without sacrificing the curriculum and the marks and the that you need to provide uh, that you're accountable for. So anyway, we'll get a chance to ask some questions and talk back and forth as this is interactive. Mitch, go ahead and flip the slide over. And the key word for EdChat Interactive is interactive. So I want you guys, after this is done, to not stop talking with each other, not stop talking on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. Go talk to me. If there's any questions that I haven't been able to answer, please, 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 please reach out. I'm very approachable. I'm always an open door, even if my schedule is packed tight and busy. Um, use the hashtag MindGage, that'll get my attention, and uh, you can contact me at any of those. Don't worry, if you're missing any of those, you don't have to write them down. I'll be sending all of you via email um, that toolkit, and that has all those details in there, including the entire presentation we're going through today. So I'm going to whip through this, guys. You've had an opportunity to kind of figure out how to use Shindig. So the first thing I want you to do is actually introduce yourself in the chat box, and this is going to be key. While you're doing that, next slide. I want to introduce myself, all right? So introduce yourself and I'll introduce myself. Why should you guys pay attention to me? I'm not just a YouTuber. I don't just deal with children. Um, I have a, a, a round of skills that I bring to the table. So when it comes to my three passions, there is games and gaming. I've been doing it since the age of six, and I'm absolutely passionate about it. I've learned so much from games. I have learned more from games in some cases than I have ever learned in any of my classes at school. And that is a challenge that educators certainly have to, uh, to account for. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm very passionate about entrepreneurship. But I'm very, very passionate about student engagement and educational leadership. I've sat on a number of different committees, uh, school board committees, student committees, entrepreneurial student groups. I've also had the privilege of being asked to sit on the board of governors for Niagara College, through which my work there actually received me honors from the government of Canada. So I received a parliamentary citation in 2010. And I continue to actively support educators and students in their engagement and in their learning uh, in everything that I do, or at least I always try to. Hopefully I can continue doing that with MindGage. So next slide. We are going to do uh, some level of breakout sessions. So for now, the breakout session that I want to have happen, I, I don't want to have 
a breakout session particular right now. We're going to cover a couple things first. But I want you guys to take an opportunity and kind of set your minds up for what we're going to be discussing. Uh, and that'll help me sort of guide the direction of the conversation and the flow of the conversation as I'm watching the chat. So make sure you're going into that I am chat room. So down in the right hand side of the corner or wherever your picture is and click on the I am chat. Make sure that you guys are in there. And I want to see three things popping up. All right. Now you can do it in the chat or you can write it down on a piece of paper. Again, interactive, prep yourselves. What do you want to do with Minecraft? Why do you want to use Minecraft? And what curriculum or lesson? are you most interested in teaching with Minecraft or do you feel is going to be something that you can start with? Because uh, again, the majority of the educators here are looking for ways to get started in Minecraft. So make sure you're doing that in the chat or at least writing it down on a piece of paper so that you can kind of think about it and we'll bring it up in a breakout session. Mitch, next slide. For now, I want to talk a little bit about where I see Minecraft fitting into the classroom. And I see Minecraft fitting into the classroom best in two ways, either game-based learning or project-based learning. Now, in order to, to approach any game-based learning subject, you have to get the, the elephant out of the room. Game-based learning is not the same as gamification. And I'm sure you know that, I'm going to clarify a, a little bit here. So gamification is really, it's applying common game elements like badging or web questing or team points or points to a particular non-game activity. Um, I, I'm okay with game-based learning or gamification, uh, but I wouldn't say it's my favorite. And there's a good reason why. There's a concept called diminishing returns. And what ends up happening is when you, when you just layer one particular engagement element, which is gamification, on top of a, a different element, it's transparent uh, after a point in time, but it suffers from diminishing returns. So the novelty will end up wearing off. And we're seeing this in a lot of the research out there lately uh, about gamification and some of the research, I should say, out there about gamification. Um, and it can end up having a negative effect. So what it can do is if it becomes too overt that you're, you're literally just trying to scapegoat education around this sort of bubble of something else, then you get this disconnect. And it's this, this visceral disconnect. Um, however, game-based learning is the place where I cater to and where I absolutely love. Because it's the type of gameplay where you actually interlace the learning objectives into it. And what you have happening is that idea that I was talking about before where games are not tied to the cognitive functions, when you're in a game, all of that information that you're surrounded with in that immersive world is tied to so many different parts of your brain, to your heart, to your emotion, and that becomes a powerful retention strategy. It becomes extremely powerful for reconnecting those ideas when it comes test time, reconnecting those ideas 10 years down the road, and it has tremendous impact on critical thinking and problem solving skills. So I like to look at game-based learning like this. If you take three rubber band balls and you throw them up in the air, the students are going to go for the fun one, <laughs> the administrators are going to go for the assessment, and the educators are going to go for the lesson. Right? And you know, I'm, I'm loosely saying that. Uh, but the reality is with game-based learning, all of those rubber band strands are pulled out and they're wrapped together to a point where you don't know where one begins and the other ends. And this allows a concept of hidden learning or what um, the last lecture, um, oh my goodness, I can't believe his name has slipped my mind. Um, he's the author of the last lecture. Anyway, he calls it, Randy Pausch, he calls it the head fake method where students are learning, but they don't see it as learning. They see it as fun, as engaging. And that's what we want to get to in Minecraft. PBL is a great place to start. Another one is project-based learning. Mitch, if you go with the next slide. And project-based learning and game-based learning have this concept that I put up there of uh, illusion of control. By giving some of that control back, yet still putting some boundaries in place, students will be more likely to engage and invest in that topic, in that subject. So project-based learning is essentially teaching method where students uh, gain the knowledge and skills by working on a particular project. They can answer a complex pro question, a problem, a challenge. Perhaps you're looking at how do I, uh, how, do, how do we change our world uh, to be more renewable resource friendly? And the students can go into any type of project and start analyzing it from the angles that they see and come up with the resolutions. Now, there are some challenges, of course, with everything. There's some pros and cons. 
Um, Project-based learning and game-based learning are a little bit more difficult to assess if you don't do it correctly. And there's a function here in project-based learning called cognitive load. And that's the variance between the novice and the adept. And you know, as a researcher, if you go and you start doing research on a topic that you have absolutely no clue about, and you're just brand new beginning, your research and your learning outcome, if it's not controlled, is going to be vastly different and you may achieve the same learning outcome that somebody who's adept will get. Uh, so that one of the things that you can do to kind of in project-based learning clarify that is set controls. And you need to do the same in game-based learning as well. But the benefits are that students become more invested in their work. The connections to real-world situations are more readily available, and it harnesses 21st century skills. Next slide. Game-based learning on a similar path. Uh, they have the power to drive that, that dopamine process, the mental, emotional impact, the subconscious, the conscious, all flowing together. And if you layer in and tie in all those learning objectives within the game, then you get this real opportunity to provide a, a, a broader context for that lesson. Uh, games by design as well have to incorporate some key functions, which we'll get into later on in the discussion. Uh, improvement, opportunity for leveling. It's not a game if there's no opportunity for failure. right? And, and we've been afraid for a long time of failure. I say don't. Failure is an opportunity to improve. And students are cognizant of that. Students know when they get into a game, they're going to fail. They're not going to do perfect the first time. And there's always that opportunity to go for the new high score and the better. And that's something that we can take with game-based learning. They engage, uh, they, they allow more retention, improve critical thinking skills, and just it's that overall investment, that immersion where a student wants to keep playing. So the goal is, how do we get that into the classroom? Next slide, Mitch. And we're going to discuss that. So over the next five minutes or so, I want to start connecting with various groups. So I'd like to see everybody kind of getting together in groups of two or three. And we want to start understanding where we're coming from in Minecraft. So why do you want to use Minecraft are some of the questions I want to see happening. What PL or GBL have you experienced? And what impacts or benefits do you think that they're going to provide? Uh, and then through the rest of the conversation, we'll end up being able to get to a point where we, uh, we start to learn how to design PBL and GBL components into our classrooms in Minecraft. So break out and I'm going to jump in and, uh, and join a couple of people, various groups, and see what kind of discussion we can have. Mitch, do I... Well, I may have brought uh, Garrett down a little bit too soon, but uh, this is your time. This is the time now to pre you know, prepare for the Minecraft discussion. Uh, Garrett gave some, some great background information on game-based learning and the differences between game-based learning, gamification, game-based learning, and problem-based learning. And now is, is the time for us to kind of figure out, so what is it? Now that we have a, everybody has the same background on game-based learning and project-based learning, what is what exactly do we want to, to accomplish in Minecraft? Click on one or two other icons. I see somebody has their hand rates, and I'll and I'll come down in a second and uh, find out what you want. Uh, but click on one or two icons for, from some. Click on an icon to join a group, and um, and discuss. I'm going to pull myself down, and uh, we'll come up in about four minutes.
Okay, that's been about about five minutes, pretty close. I'm going to bring Garrett back up now. Jordan, I'm going to be. Hey, uh, so I may have interrupted another conversation, but I think uh, you're back up on the stage. The, ah, there we go. Are you there? It takes a second for it to uh, to drop back down. Perfect. Thank you, Mitch. All right. Um, so, were you able to? You looked like you were talking with some people. Yeah, yeah. In the chat room. Definitely got a chance. So what were the types of things that they were doing? So we were actually discussing uh, with Katrina, and I wish I had left a little bit more time for it because the, the conversation was great. And some of the things that came up were uh, Irv Spanish, who's a gentleman I know very, very well from Twitter. He uses project-based learning and game-based learning quite a bit in his approach. And one of the interesting things that came up that I definitely have to hone in on is when it comes to Minecraft, we cannot disconnect from what the game is. And I'll be covering that a little bit uh, more uh, through the next part of the presentation. But one of the interesting things that Herb was mentioning is he sets goals for his students in designing these project-based learning maps and gives them not just teacher goals, not you have to learn this, but integrated goals that, that have to do with the gameplay itself. And that becomes a powerful engagement tool. That's what makes it a game. If there are no goals, no opportunity to try again and to fail. Those are things that make it a game. And if you're disconnecting from that, then it just becomes another sort of scapegoat for education tool. And we definitely don't want to get to that point with Minecraft. That's fascinating. Um, now, is there anybody that you'd like to bring up to the stage? Or do you want me to bring up your slides? What, what do you want next? I think we'll we'll bring people up on the, uh, the second start. If you bring up the slides, we've got about two minutes here to kind of discuss how Minecraft is going to support your goals. Was there anybody that you had a conversation with uh, within Minecraft? I can certainly bring up Irv. He is a fantastic person to talk. If there's somebody that you felt was uh, had an interesting point to say, then great. But if not, let's uh, let's get Irv up here because I think he's got some real insight in how uh, learning results and classroom engagement have been used uh, in the field of Minecraft. Is that possible, Mitch? Ah, see, I'm wow. I'm learning. <laughs> if he drops the slides down or brings the slides up, it, it, he no longer has control okay. over them. Right. Oh, so um, yes, but what I'll do is I'll bring myself back down and I'll bring uh, Irv up. So Perfect. give me one second. Irv, my friend, I'm putting you on the spot. How are you today? I can't hear you, and I'm not sure if okay. it's just. I got it. I had to there unmute we, myself. <laughs> there we go. So, Irv, you've been using project-based learning in the classroom. And one of the interesting things that, uh, that I'm dealing with on the next slide is sort of, you know, what is, what is the benefit to using Minecraft in the classroom? And I think that's a question that everybody sort of wants to hear. Is it giving you better learning results? Is it increasing classroom engagement? What are the things that you've pulled out of using it that are, are really impactful for both you and students? I would say number one is engagement. And I teach high school students. And I was kind of afraid, especially with my upperclassmen that were juniors and seniors, that they would think it was dumb. <laughs> um, and it was the exact opposite. Even kids that had never played Minecraft uh, and were kind of, at the beginning, negative about the whole concept. Um, by the end of the year, they were, they were actually sad that uh, some of the seniors were sad they were going to graduate because they wanted to continue to play out these different scenarios. Uh, and we, my, I teach Spanish, so um, all of my scenarios had to do with something, a task within the game where they had to communicate in the Spanish language with each other, and sometimes with me, but usually with each other, um, in order to complete certain tasks uh, to meet an end goal. Um, it was both competitive, collaborative. It's it's very easy to set up within Minecraft. Just I mean, the scenarios are, you know, all kinds of silly things you can set up, and you would think they would not be into it, but they are way into it. And in the end, what happened was communication in my class went from canned scenarios, what I call canned scenarios, um, basically a scripted response to everything, to more creative responses because the game demanded it. So they wanted to know more language to be able to communicate better, to 
be able to uh, make themselves clearer, you know? Yeah. So clear critical thinking, clear 21st century skills, and clear engagement. I think yeah. those are the, the key things that can be taken out of that. Um, and you, uh, Mitch, I'll go ahead and ask you to put up the slides. I want to thank you, Irv, for, for coming up here. I'm going to uh, tie on a little bit of this conversation and say, you know, Irv uh, is actually using game-based learning technique. He's creating goals. He's crea creating these scenarios, these, uh, these narratives, these storylines that students can get involved in uh, and using that very, very effectively. So uh, to the next slide, two slides forward, actually. Mitch, we've gone ahead and, uh, and taken care of that. So what we're going to discuss over the next couple of minutes is, do you build it? Do you have it built? Do you, you know, find a game that's aligned? Um, do you use it to engage, inspire, teach? You know, what is the reason for using it? And then, of course, we're going to get into a little bit of game-based learning design in Minecraft. And how do you, how do you really use game-based design principles to harness the participation without disconnecting from those students and to really make it impactful for them so that you get a result like Irv, so that you get students who are you know actively involved and passionate again about their learning uh, so next slide and there's a big question that has to be asked uh, students have first first thing we have to understand is our audience Students have a preconceived expectation to Minecraft. Any student who has played Minecraft for more than two months has a preconceived notion of what it is. And that sits with their passion. And this is one of the interesting things about Minecraft, is it has something for everybody. So Minecraft can be a building tool. It can be a creative tool. Minecraft can be a social tool. It can be a collaboration thing that draws a student in. Uh, and Minecraft can be an adventure thing, where you go and you play in this survival world, and you've got to you know, kill creepers and protect your land and do things like that. So your goal or your, your question that you have to ask yourself is, do you manage that expectation by saying, look, guys, this is not going to look exactly like your game, uh, but hopefully we'll still be able to get the results out of it? Or do you meet them in the middle? Do you meet that expectation of theirs? And in order to do that, you've got to be familiar with the game. So I would encourage everybody to play the game. Um, I'm, I'm a big supporter of the idea that when you're designing these lessons, try and tie something in for everybody. And I think Irv actually did that with his Spanish Puebla map, uh, the Battle of Puebla. He added the social interaction. Well, the social interaction happened, uh, you know, just on its own, which is good. Uh, he allowed the students to get in and do some of the building and to do some of the creating. But he also provided the action and the adventure because it was centered around a battle. This kept engaged those students who were just like, I just want to fight. I just want to go into Minecraft and PvP. So it gave them that opportunity. And there's ways in Minecraft where you can really use that effectively. So if you're a actor using only one wheel, use the game for where it's going to meet the students' needs as well. And that's going to really empower your engagement in the classroom. Next slide. We talked a little bit about some of the challenges with, uh, with game-based learning. Right? Some of the difficulties with game-based learning and project-based learning being that uh, assessment is sometimes a little bit difficult. Uh, it, it's not always easy to connect directly to the goals. I hope everybody can see those slides um, and the picture. There's, there's a picture of a house being built there. So the question really becomes, why do you build it or do you have it? Um, and I think everybody can build it. Everybody should be able to build their lessons to really maximize the effect. The challenge with game-based learning and, and project-based learning, or game-based learning actually, is you can go out there and you can find games that you, know, you can try and fit and squeeze in uh, to a classroom uh, or to a learning objective, or you can build it yourself. And by building it yourself, you get to have a little bit more control. You get to cover those control aspects that you need to to make sure that the uh, the variance between novice and adept is, is not as much of a problem by guiding and directing the research. And you get a balance between learning and fun. And you can really incorporate that. Um, next slide. Since this one's not showing up the picture of the house. <laughs> so there's a couple of options that I'd like to share with you guys. So you guys can bring back to your teachers. And this is sort of Minecraft options to... Uh, to be able to design your lessons around and using Minecraft, like Irv was talking about. So in mass, you've got creepers. Now, creepers are these really interesting little characters. And actually, you can see one back up above me there. 
So that's a creeper. I keep him far away from me so he doesn't explode my computer desk. Um, but creepers drop gunpowder. And there's some interesting mathematical principles you can get out of that. You can actually kill a bunch of creepers and see how many gunpowder 20 of them or 25 of them or 30 of them drop. And you can do this in waves. And from there, you can get into concepts like probability. You can get into concepts like, okay, what is the, uh, the amount of gunpowder that I'm going to get per creeper when you take a look at that? So you've got statistics, you've got combinations, you've got permutations that you can use. In terms of science, mods, 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 mods. Mods are absolutely fantastic. If you're talking about electrical sciences or computer sciences, we've got mods like computer craft, you've got large, large scale redstone mods. Uh, if it's something like architecture or, or sorry, archaeology, you've got mods. So there's plenty of mods out there. All you really have to do is search for Minecraft mods. Over the next uh, little bit, I'll be giving you some examples of people who've used uh, modeling the theory or modeling the idea in science. And then you have things like coding and creative arts. So somebody was asking primarily about creative arts uh, or writing, you know, language arts, storytelling. Imagine it. You're reading a story and you have your students recreate or you find a map that's connected to this and drop them into the world that is that story. So I had one teacher who uh, was out on Twitter and she was asking, she was trying to teach a book and it was about this Bible island, this island where you know the, the person had to survive and we found a perfect map for her to use. And here's what it did. The kids were now more interested in reading that story because they got to go into the world and pretend like they were in the story. Now that's engagement. That right there is what is needed to put yourself into that frame of mind, to experience viscerally, emotionally, mentally, all of the different aspects of a story. It's amazing. And then you can also have students create their own stories. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Simon Badley uh, who creates a map called Storytime or has created for his students a map called Storytime. And they go out and they go and look at Viking coves and different caves and all of these. And they have to write stories on it. They have to come back and they have to tell about their experience and their adventure. So again, something for everybody. History, research it, rebuild it. Um, social studies, get into a narrative. Do a cultural build. Uh, a couple of the things that we're doing here with the, uh, the social studies paradigm is taking Elizabethan London and really doing a lot of research on the back end and putting in the actual characters. So we've got quest characters within this Elizabethan London world where students will interact and engage and they give insight into what the culture was like. And that's students in a paradigm where they're now connected with these individuals. They get to see what is different. And we can incorporate so many things like that. But the key is engage with it. Use game-based learning techniques, use narrative, real-world applications, quests, adventures, playtime, 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 and skills-based activities. Next slide. We've designed, and you guys will get this in your toolkit package, we've designed a uh, designing game-based learning in Minecraft uh, sort of uh, infographic. This is just the head of the infographic. There's a lot more material below, so you guys will get that. But if you guys, number one, step number one, if you guys haven't played Minecraft, and haven't actually experienced building in Minecraft, creative, survival in Minecraft, surviving your first night. We run workshops, and that is one of the things that we make sure everybody does. It's survive one night, because it's easier said than done, and the emotional response that even teachers, even the most non-gamer, gets out of it, being able to survive their first night in Minecraft is huge. So get to know the game, play the game, Tame the game, be a part of it, because that's how you're really going to figure out how to engage with your students on it. Uh, and then moving through the rest, we'll, we'll get into some tools for in-game assessments and how do you assess and do all of that. So keep an eye on that. Uh, Mitch is coming back up. Yes. So there were, there were two, two questions that, that people have asked, and uh, I'll, yes. I'll be their voice. Uh, one is that you know, when, when a lot of us think of a game, we think of something with points that somebody wins or somebody loses. So, you know, why, why, is, Microsoft, why is Minecraft a game? Sorry, repeat that. Why is, What's, what is game about? Why, is, why do we call Minecraft a game instead of just a place that, where you build stuff? You see, Minecraft is a game. In fact, if you take the original version of Minecraft, there was no creative. Uh, creative was not allowed. 
The first iteration of Minecraft was about survival. It was a survival game only. The element of it was that you could break blocks, you could break wood, you could break trees, you could mine for your resources and survive based on that. So survival in itself in the game of Minecraft is a game. But what they started seeing was that students were not just surviving, they were thriving. They were doing even more. They were building these amazing creations and literally having to work hard to mine the blocks and gather up the resources and materials in order to create amazing things like uh, the, the Starship Enterprise, like the Death Star. Like just imagine some of the things that built and created in Minecraft. And that's mm -hmm. when Minecraft started taking off. Once those big, beautiful, amazing, immersive things came around, that's when people stopped looking at the game like, oh, this is like 1980s graphics. When you see somebody take blocks and create a Monsters University, that was one of my first builds. Actually, another one of my first builds was I recreated, um, for a good YouTube friend of mine, I recreated the Little Mermaid's Palace. I recreated the Sultan's wow. Palace in Minecraft on Xbox and, and from Aladdin. These amazing things, when you see these pictures, that's what drives the community, is everybody wants to compete with each other and do better. But it is a game because it does have a goal. But the key is the students set the goal. The children set the goal. The community sets the goal. Uh, we drive each other forward to try and do new things, to better ourselves, to uh, do better than the other people around us. Um, and then one of the biggest things uh, that, that drove Minecraft as well is the minigame servers. Uh, I mm -hmm. can tell you every Minecrafter on uh, PC knows about minigames, and every Minecrafter on Xbox or PS4 or PlayStation, they know about minigames. Minigames are being created. So there's those, those planted games where the students go into an environment and challenge themselves. So where it originally was just a survival game, because of the, mm -hmm. you know, the ability of people to recreate it and make it in their, their own desire image, uh, it's now turned into something where it is actually a game. Uh, it's just there's many different game modes, and we do the same thing with MindGage. Is we create games. Okay, and okay, and and then the, a sec, just that was that was a great answer. Thanks. And I was is that the curveball? I was also looking at, at a second question, which is you know my, Minecraft and the things that you do with Minecraft seem a lot like uh, kids' game design, which um, and is. Are they the same? Is there a huge overlap? Are they some two completely different animals? Nope. Well, how would you answer that? I think every single person who is uh, more than one year in Minecraft, every single person who is two months into Minecraft, who's watched Stampy Longnose, a uh, friend of mine, and who plays on minigame server, recognizes that they can create that themselves. And that's one of the driving influences. So yes, I would encourage teachers to learn game design, teach the students game design. In fact, one of the things we're doing at MindGage is creating the game for you so that you can get a start, so that you can actually plug and play it, drop it in, it's accessible, it's, it's got all the components working and it's perfect for the educational paradigm. But we're not doing this to, to try and say you have to use this all the time. You need that platform, but you've got to get to that stage through practice, through use, to be able to drive that. And students can help you with that. The students can help. Um, one of the, the interesting conversations that I have, and I'm going a little off topic here, but is you have strengths. So some students like to design stories. Some students like to do the building. And some students like to uh, worry about the coding details. Use them. Have them create a game. Have them create a game-based lesson. And by doing that, you're going to be able to pull the attention of every single student. You're going to have the students who want to write the stories who are designing the characters and saying, okay, this is what he's going to say. This is the story that he's going to come up with. Oh, my name is Johnny, and I'm missing my portfolio. Could you find it for me? And you get that interaction. And then you have the students who are going to go in and do the programming of it. Now, this is, of course, higher levels of, of use, but use it. You can do it at the basic level. You can do it at the higher level. Okay, good. So I'm going to bring myself down. Uh, there's a couple more questions. So I am them to you, and I'll bring your slides back up. Awesome. So go on to the next slide because we're actually in a uh, we're in a breakout session that I want to have happen. But I'm going to get you to flip forward a couple of slides. Actually, one more slide, 
and then we'll go back. I wanted to do this sort of reverse, but you know, we'll end up going back. Um, so I'm going to leave this with you. I'm going to cover this very, very briefly. What makes a good game? All right. So keep this in mind as we're having a, a little bit of a discussion to finalize everything. Uh, a good game is immersive. It has an illusion of control. It is a sense of achievement. There are balanced mechanics. So it's not too easy. It's not too hard. And there's always an opportunity for improvement, an opportunity for failure, and an opportunity for improvement. And by integrating all these things, the interaction, the challenge, the narrative, scaling goals, mechanics, and repetition, that leads to mastery. And that leads to mastery of the game. If you layer in education into that, you've got yourself a powerful, powerful tool for getting people from stage one to full mastery. And then keep an eye on poor, poor game design. Uh, take that through the, uh, the toolkit that we send you. Next slide real quick. Actually, two more slides forward. And we're going to whip through these real quick. And then we're going to get into some discussions. So this is one of the maps modules that we have made. Um, it just kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that you can do. So this is Elizabethan London. And imagine having your student actually play or, or create a play with Shakespeare. Do this. Set up Shakespeare as a villager. Or use custom NPCs like we do. And set it up. And let Shakespeare tell the student that he wants help writing the play. This creates investment. Down below, uh, figure out the math. You know, you can put problems into the math and tie them into real world scenarios that might happen. And it just becomes a powerful tool. The students will want to learn it because they're in this immersive environment and want to want to do good by this baker. Or perhaps the money that the baker is going to give the student uh, or the, the reward is going to help them in a future quest. So give some thought to those. Next slide. David Lee EdTech, a couple of people that you want to follow and a couple of examples that I want to cover. This will all be, of course, links in the toolkit. We're running a little bit low on time here. Uh, David Lee EdTech, fantastic. He's done an amazing entrepreneurial math project, and it's a very role-playing atmosphere. What he's done is created a role-play environment where students get to go in, and he they have to pitch a business. They have to find out the, um, the mathematics of profit, loss, and these are grade four students. They need to figure out terminology like capital, investment, and be able to pitch that their business is sound. Uh, Edu Elfie did a science map on neurotransmitters. Now, this guy is fantastic. He's done some amazing stuff in science. And imagine being able to show how neurotransmitters work when a student can't go into a brain and a picture just does not do it justice, nor does a video. Next slide. And then we've got Simon Bad, 64. Simon Baddeley, this Storyland map, English, language arts, creative writing. Follow these people. Take a look at the work that they're doing. Follow hashtag MindGageEDU. Hello, Lynn. Lynn's actually a team member with MindGageEDU uh, with our company here. So feel free in the chat to say hi to her. Uh, John Miller EDU did a poetry island. Now, he's a world history teacher who incorporated poetry. English language, creative writing, writing skills into a history lesson. It's one of the big powerful things about Minecraft and education is this cross-curricular opportunity that we have, especially if you're taking it from a game-based learning approach. Click the slide. We have on the toolkit, we have a number of lessons that we have started developing. Um, most of the lesson plans are on the back end, but you guys can feel free to go to the website and take a look at all the lesson ideas. Spark your ideas. Use us to spark your own ideas. We don't mind. In fact, if you want to connect with us afterwards and talk a little bit about some of the ideas that you have and how you can really make them empowering and impactful, don't hesitate. Um, Mitch, what we're going to do is go back about four slides and... It's going to be the, yeah, okay, you know what, let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's go right down to the end. Just because we are at the, the fairly end, let's go back one slide, Mitch. I wanted to make this a little bit more interactive. I apologize, everybody. This is the first time I've ever done an EdChat interactive, and I didn't. I didn't know my timings, <laughs> so I apologize. And there's a lot of information to cover, but, 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 but. This gives us an opportunity to connect afterwards. And please do so. I'm more than happy to help you guys reach your goals. Um, follow some of these people. Coffee Chug Books, 
project-based learning, Trish Cloud, the Come people, uh, also Irv Spanish. Uh, Irv, make sure you put your Twitter in the chat there so everybody can connect with you. And I'll be tweeting out all these people later as well. Um, in regards to sharing real-world applications, the common people, iLearning UK, Immersive Minds, ourselves, MindGate GDU, hands-on difficult concepts, game-based narrative adventures, that's, that's our speciality. Uh, we do the game-based narrative adventures, um, and, and we're quite good at it, I should say, or at least we're getting good at it. Uh, and then, of course, general, follow MindGage EDU, Mr. Isaacs, uh, B. Irv, uh, Bob Irving, he tweets out every week an entire thing about, uh, he pulls resources from all over the web, all over the net, all over YouTube, and he puts them all in a stupid. Follow him. Follow him because you're going to get some amazing ideas from people who are just YouTubers out there, from people who are not educators but have created something unique and special that you can then take those ideas back into your classrooms and use. And of course, the world famous Colin Gallagher, make sure you keep an eye on him. Next slide, I'm going to tie it up and then I'm going to spend uh, a couple of minutes uh, kind of talking with a few people. If you do want to connect, me afterwards hit me up on Twitter at PB Jelly Games and I'm more than happy to carry on the conversation uh, after that at least for a little while it's getting a little late at night here um, so sum up Minecraft in the classroom engagement that's it engagement you have an opportunity to drag kids into an immersive environment to a gameplay methodology where all of their neural receptors all of their learning is going to be tied to multiple parts of their brain and they're going to learn it, and they're going to retain it, and they're going to have fun doing so. Never lose the fun of Minecraft. Uh, the biggest fear that I have is that Minecraft will become a fad. If we use Minecraft like a piece of graph, graph paper, and this is just my opinion, if we use Minecraft as if it's a piece of graph, pa graph paper and only use it for math or STEM or anything like that and do it in a way that you know you could do it in any other way, it's going to quickly lose its novelty. The novelty is going to wear off. So GBL, PBL, best places to start with Minecraft. Uh, lesson design tips. You know what? Meet the preconceived expectations. Keep the engagement as a top priority. Um, and allow room for the in-the-moment assessments. And we can talk about that at some other point in time. I might do a webinar based on that. How do you build a sense into your, your lessons in Minecraft? Um, Game-based learning is a strategy, narrative, storylines, questing, role play, things that already get kids involved and actively passionate about games become very important. And then of course, ask for assistance and collaborate. Work with each other on your lesson designs and your lesson ideas on building something that the kids are going to walk into class with and be like, wow, that's so cool. Uh, share resources, find resources, and uh, you know, kind of take it from there. Guys, I, I hope I hope, I hope that this wasn't boring for you. Um, I certainly hope that you guys got some impact out of it and at least have a baseline for where you're going to take Minecraft to the next level. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter, uh, hashtag MindGageEDU, or sorry, hashtag MindGage, and you can also follow me at PB Jelly Games. I'd be happy to connect with each and every single one of you and help see what we can do to help you guys drive your lessons forward. Mitch, thank you. Sure. You know, one of the things that, that because we did run out of time, I'm thinking that maybe maybe you can do another one or maybe a couple more specifically on on selected topics in mind, ELA and assessment, and maybe one on uh, science and collaboration, where we tie a 21st century skill along with a, a particular academic subject together, and we discuss that, and because it'll be a narrower topic, we'll have more time for interaction with people. Do you think that might be an interesting idea to try in, in the future? I, I think that's absolutely perfect. And the slideshow, Kathleen, will be available. I just saw that pop up, and I want to cover that before we close off. The slideshow will be available if you have not signed up via the EdChat Interactive website. We don't have your email addresses. So if you have not, send me a message on Twitter at PBJellyGames. I will follow you, follow me, and you can DM me your email address, and I will make sure that that slideshow gets to you, including the toolkit. Um, and the toolkit is a uh, lesson planning document that helps align to game-based learning. 
Uh, so that'll come in very, very valuable. Also, it has a number of additional resources uh, for Minecraft. How do you pitch it to administrators, things like that. So uh, keep that in mind. Mitch, you're absolutely right. One of the things that I noticed when I was going through sort of everybody's responses on what they wanted to get out of it is that they literally spanned the gamut. Uh, they, <laughs> they, they spanned from Minecraft to the other. There's so much that I think Minecraft is so new that there's so many educators who want to use it for certain specific purposes, and I think that's great, but it doesn't leave the time to cover it all in one session. So right. I think multiple right. sessions really are needed, and if, if everybody's willing to have me back, I am more than happy to come on. What I think I would do, though, is bring on another expert uh, along with me to discuss these ideas who is directly engaged in that particular thing. So if it's okay. a history, that sounds thing, great. Or yeah. If it's, uh, you know, English creative writing thing, maybe Simon Baddeley. Um, and I think that would be very valuable for, for the educators out there. Okay. And uh, at some point, uh, maybe you can get to Gene, if it, you'll have his email address. And he was interested about open world servers and could you recommend one? But that's probably something that you, pro you could take offline and have a conversation with him. Um, but in the meantime, it is after eight o'clock. We eight in the east, uh, five on the west coast. So we don't really want to keep you beyond your um, beyond your deadlines. So uh, we will have another Ed Chat interactive tomorrow. Uh, Garrett and I will talk for the next couple of days, and maybe we'll schedule uh, two or four. You know, somewhere between two and four more sessions on um, on uh, Minecraft and uh, we'll see you at future events. This will be archived so you'll be able to take a look at um, you know you'll be able to review this this we'll, we'll, we'll put the slides on the archive and we'll also make sure that we have Garrett's uh, Twitter address so that you can tweet him and get more information directly from him. So um, this is uh, Mitch Weisberg. I'm, I'm going to sign off. Garrett any any last words? You know what, guys? May all your Minecrafting efforts be valuable, impactful, and engaging for students. I want to thank you all very much for taking the time to listen to me. Hopefully, I wasn't too drony and boring. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that we got some good conversations at any rate. And next one, we'll leave a lot more time for interaction so that we can focus on the course. Mitch, I want to thank you and the team at EdChat Interactive for putting this together. I think the talking head uh, or the interactive webinar is fantastic. It's a beautiful approach, and uh, I think everybody appreciates it. So big round of applause to you guys, and thank you all very much for your time. I'll see you guys on Twitter. Okay. Take care.